is the hype around cameras like back? Fuji came out of nowhere, dropped this new camera on our lap, and it quickly became the number one fast selling camera on the market. Let's not just skip past the fact that Fuji has it a stellar, superior image. If you get on social media, the amount of money that you're making can be a professional gig. Hey, this is a great camera, but your ecosystem sucks. Super excited to have you guys here today. The question of the day though, and this has to do with this crazy week, because honestly, like we've been talking about red cameras and like all the Sony cameras, but it seems like Fuji came out of nowhere, dropped this new camera on our lap, and it quickly became the number one most like fast selling camera on the market in a time where I personally thought that camera sales were done. Like I thought people's hype around cameras were pretty much done. And so the question for you guys in the chat right now is, is the hype around cameras like back? Is it dead? Is, is camera hype over? I really want to know what you guys think in the chat. Guys, I know you guys shoot on tons of different cameras, and we got Mr. Fuji fanboy sitting right here straight Fan across from me. Harsh. <laughs> it's harsh. It's, it's, it's only harsh. harsh if it's not true, and I feel like it's pretty true. Borderline, but not fanboy. Okay, he just don't want to accept it yet. Borderline. He don't want to accept it yet. But let me know, like, Kofi, what do you think about camera hype right now, especially with this Fuji camera? Because, I mean, I think it helps that it's only, what, $1,500 or something like that? But, like... I think specifically for, like, the X100X, I keep getting... <laughs> I always get that thing wrong. But anyways, I think the, the thing with that one is that it's one of the few cameras that garnered a broad audience outside of professionals. So, yeah. so many people are like, oh, this camera that appeals to me, I don't need to be a professional photographer for se per se because it got hype off of like a TikTok or something, mm -hmm. which I don't know if that person is a professional photographer. But when you have something that has so much of a broad audience, we're seeing that now in camera sales, right? And with that, you're also going to get a little bit of pushback from people that are buying it because if you have a video that gets a million views, you're going to get a bunch of praise, but you're going to get those weird comments that are come out of there because there's so many people. Right. Um, but yeah, I think the Fuji X 106 is a camera where you don't have to want to be a professional photographer, but you could still have fun with it. And I think that's why there's so many people getting it. And I think that's where I don't think the hype is dead. I think there's just certain cameras that might appeal to certain audiences that catch on with right. A cinema camera, very niched. So if the, if the, in the upgrade per se isn't, crazy and we don't kind of we kind of don't care we're not buying cinema cameras left and right well and speaking of cinema cameras i know justin you guys use a lot of cinema cameras yep. here you guys run this big production company obviously led wall you have the bolt but like when you see a camera that's like fifteen hundred dollars taking over the industry like as a professional do you care I, I personally, it makes me excited to watch uh, other creatives learn and, I mean, have new tools to create stunning work. Uh, that makes me excited. Uh, you know, for me, I'm always looking for the next best high dynamic range, global shutter, high speed, and that costs money. So uh, um, for those that uh, are just, you know, wanting to get their, can uh, you know, get their hands dirty and get some really stunning stuff, I, it excites me. Yeah, and I mean... Now, I know you, I know you don't want to call you a Fuji fanboy, but like, what's your, what's your main camera? Anything. Oh, okay. Yeah. Anything. I don't, I don't anything. Mean, anything. But, no, no, no. but <laughs> I, I, for the last nine months, I've been shooting primarily on the Fuji so H2S. does this camera mean anything to you? Because I mean, obviously you're using more of their interchangeable lenses. I feel like Fuji is one of those weird brands where like they have everything from like high end professional cameras all the way down to literally Insta stack, you know, take a picture Polaroid mm -hmm. style cameras that pop out. When you see a camera like this, does it make you feel like the brand is stronger or is it like just all hype? I don't know if it's... Well, first, first of all, let's not just skip past the fact that Fuji has a stellar, superior image. Like, the, it's the image. It's, it's not just, oh, this is the camera. Because plenty of cameras just came out. Plenty of cameras came out, maybe in, even in that affordable price range. But Fuji creates an image that people are just excited about. And you have all these film simulations within the camera that help you get a look that you don't need to be an editor. Because that was a big thing that people say about Fuji Films. Like, you can just post the JPEGs. You don't need RAW. You can just post Fuji JPEGs and be able to get a look right out of the camera that it just looks different than most people's, um, like Canon or Sony. It does look different. And um, to be able to get that look from a JPEG and then post right to your 
your social media, it's, it's, it means something to people. I think I agree with that. I think for me, when I look at this camera in particular, I look at it as like, like for a long time, the camera that I've always wanted, and I still want it, is the Leica Q. And it's because it's a simple camera. I can take photos with it, JPEGs even. It's got a fixed lens on it. It just simplifies like all the stuff that yeah. comes with creating. You know, like whenever you use like a traditional camera or a professional camera, big quotes, uh, like you got to think about like ISO and you, you're going to shoot in raw and then you got to bring it in Lightroom. And you're going to do all these different things. And Fuji, very much like Leica to me, they both seem like brands that like they do a good job at just getting you a good image just straight out of camera, which I think to Kofi's point is like why we see like a, such a mass adoption of a camera like this because professionals like how it simplifies their process, but then people who are beginners like that, they don't have to like go to school basically to learn how to utilize this camera. They can take it out of the box, throw a battery and a memory card in it, throw it in auto, snap some photos, and then the colors just come out great on it. Yeah. And not just snap photos. They can get, I believe this camera has like 6K sensor in it. Or? Yeah. So, yeah, so that's, yeah. I think that's a really, I think that's a big point with like in the world that we're moving into, obviously with social media and stuff like that, like a camera of this caliber packing some pretty big video features. I think that even goes further into talking about like sort of like the station of like where these type of cameras are going. Like yeah. you got a $1,500 camera that can shoot 6K, but it's also still this camera that anyone and everyone is going to pick up. Like what do you think that means like as far as like our world, as far as like social media, professionalism and all that? I think what's happening is a gap between, like I think there's an acceptance now, I guess from the camera companies too, because you can see that when they're coming out with their bodies that if you get on social media, the amount of money that you're making can be a professional gig. And the tools that you can use for it might not be something that someone in professional video production might make. Mm. And I think like Fuji's understanding that when Sony came up with like the A7C line, they're starting to understand, hey, some of these guys are making money on YouTube and TikTok. Why don't we make tools that suits that workflow? Mm. Right. And I don't and I think like what ends up happening from the professional side of things, we only see professional video or video that's paid a lot of money through one lens. And it's what our workflow is. Right. Right. But like mm -hmm. there's some TikTokers making crazy money, right? That might not pick up a red Komodo, right? But they might get that Fuji camera that, hey, maybe I get a I get a decent audio jack I can put in there, get a little DJI mic, shoots in 6K, it looks great. I could take great photos on it, use all the film emulations and stuff, and that's more than enough for me. Mm -hmm. And I don't have to spend $10,000, mm -hmm. right? I think camera companies are understanding that. I think it's us having to accept that there's a new kid sitting at our table <laughs> a little bit. And then once that happens, you're like, yeah, I think, I think that's where you kind of see that going. I don't think it's a replacement. I think there's just a new person that's there and a new branch of video production. And we just have to kind of move around that because camera mm -hmm. companies are figuring it out. Well, Justin, I'd love to ask you with that in mind, like, you know, you're right, Kofi, that there is this sort of like change that's happening where like the work of a videographer always was very clear. Like you had people who shot things like weddings or commercial and then you had like filmmakers that were working on like narrative or documentary films, mm -hmm. right? But now there's like this new carved path of people who kind of create for themselves a content creator. But as someone, Justin, who shoots a lot of commercial work, how do you see this like leaning into even some of the productions mm -hmm. and some of the clients that you guys are working yeah. with? Like, do you find clients are asking some of these questions about content and like where it's going to be posted? Like, do your clients want to be on TikTok or something? Yeah. So it, I like the the diversity of cameras that are coming out because there are some camera, some projects where we need to do something in super slow motion. And there's other times where I need to go to a live event and capture something um, where I can't even bring a DSLR in. So there's an iPhone 15 Pro, you know, <laughs> and we're filming the whole event on those cameras. So the, the diversity and the simplicity of some of these cameras helps the uh, me as a creator um, help even like some of my clients' budgets. Like, hey, uh, I can't use the red on this project. Um, we have a fast turnaround. Let's go ahead and use XYZ to ex expedite the process and uh, get these things out quicker. But then there's those projects where they're like, this is the highest end we want to possibly be, and we don't care about time. Uh, let's let's execute the highest we can and get the pull out the best color we can and. Uh, do the shots like 12 or 15 or 100 times. <laughs> <laughs> that's the, those are those bolt shots. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that's and I think that's really good. You touched on a point that I actually really love, and that's I feel like now we have way more options, which almost can be a little polarizing sometimes. Like, mm, it can. like it's like you, you get to a point where you're like, 
okay, there's like a hundred cameras that could do the job. Which one is the right one? And I know me and Marcus, we were playing on Instagram Live the other day. Uh, <laughs> we were on Chat GPT. And we were asking Chat GPT, you know, what's the best camera to buy in 2024? And like, it couldn't really give us a good answer. Yeah. <laughs> not only because it's AI and it's just really not that good. Yeah. <laughs> but like, it, the truth really that I started thinking about was that there's so many options. So many options. Yeah. But they're all good, right? Yep. Yeah, yep. so like I know Marcus, you're someone who has had the opportunity to. I know you, your documentary that was on the list for an Oscar that was shot on Black Magic. You shot a lot of stuff on the C70. You recently just shot some stuff even on Sony. Your one of your main cameras right now is Fuji. So like as someone who is jumping from system to system, but based off of the job flow. With so many options, how are you figuring out what is the best tool for the job? Like, what are the things that you look at and say, okay, because of this reason, I'm going with this camera? Or is it kind of like, you know, whatever the heck I feel like shooting with that yeah, day? A mixture. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely a mixture of that. And, and it, it, it comes down to the job, um, of course. And I don't like to fumble around with gear. So if I got a Franken's rig up something, it's just, it becomes a, a nuisance to me. So I'll just pick the camera that, will give me the easiest workflow, but they're all, all those cameras you just named the images look great. So image quality is like not at the top of my list anymore. Just yeah. Functionality. Um, and like, do I got the, the ports that I need for the mics? Do it, does it do time code and I need time code. Mm -hmm. Um, is it easy to take into a place and not be like noticed like a big rigged camera? So I take all of that in, into consideration, but now that's on my list, especially if it's a personal project is, Will I have fun shooting on it? Yes. And Fuji for me, the F stands for fun. And I think that's one of the main reasons a lot of people are buying this camera because it is a fun camera to shoot on. Yeah. Did you just like do that's a, a uh, did you just do a plug? That's on a mark and I pop up. Did you, I was about to say, did you just do a, uh, <laughs> a, a, a little Fuji plug on, on the stream? Just, I mean, if <laughs> the they're F watching. For fun? The, I like that. I like that. That's a, that's New a marketing mark. campaign. Yeah. 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 <laughs> that stands for fun. It's a fun camera. Yeah. yeah. And every time someone asks me like, why Fuji? The same thing, I'll be like, well, if I had a Sony, would you say, why Sony? Yeah. When I had the C70, did you say, why'd you pick the C70? But I have a Fuji, and it's like, well, why Fuji? And I'm like, why not? There's yeah. nothing you can ask me about this camera that I can't answer. It shoots 4K. It shoots 6K. It's open gate. Is your camera open gate? I don't want to answer that. You know, it's, it's a Sony <laughs> I mean, open like, gate. You know, so like, <laughs> so I ask, I, I answer all these questions, and I'm like, and, and none of that really means anything to me. It's the camera's fun. Yeah. No, absolutely. Um, now, there was a question, because you just mentioned C70, and there was a question in the chat from uh, ZT Lynx. And he says, I'm saving up for a C70. Is that still a good camera in 2024? Absolutely. I'll let you answer that question, because I know you got a lot of experience with the C70, but we put it in the chat already. This camera right here that's currently about to go live is the C70. We still use that camera to this day, and we use it for a lot of our projects. Mm -hmm. So I will quickly say, like, just to show instead of just telling, we are actually using this camera right now, and we absolutely love it for a lot of good reasons. But, Marcus, you got a chance to shoot with the C70 for for quite a while. Yeah. What was your experience like with that camera? Yeah, we just shot an entire feature with the C70. Wow. Um, documentary on autism. And... Um, it's a workhorse. I have no, I can, I could bring up a couple of things about it that I didn't like, but will I recommend it to someone that's actually looking for it? Absolutely. There's nothing more. That camera's probably for the next two or three more years. It'll probably still be one of a go-to camera. Yeah, I, I think I, I think that's too. And I think what you what you mentioned about that camera being a workhorse is one of those things that's like, you know, an absolute must, like finding that camera that does the job for you. So I know that's different for everybody, right? Like what makes a camera a workhorse for them, like is going to be different, but I think people can really benefit from different perspectives. So I love to go around the table just for a second and just be like, what is like maybe one or two like most important things for you that a camera has to have that will make it that camera? Like it, it makes it that camera. You know what I mean? So like Kofi for you, like what is, what are like one or two features that when you're picking up a camera, you're like, okay, yes, it's that camera. Or maybe it's something that the camera can't have. Like it's a problem, but what is that for you? I think two things. It's one is the ability to rig it up into different configurations because like my my freelance life bounces all over the place. And I like the idea of like just having a camera body where I'm like everything that I have is inside of it and I could mix and match to the other parts around it in camera prep and make it work instead of having to think of another option. Um, the other thing is audio. 
and I don't know if a lot of people talk about like audio imports and stuff like that. I don't like having to get another cable to plug in an audio cable. So mm -hmm. if I have to go like mini XLR to XLR or like Limo to another module to go to something else, because that's one more thing that can go wrong, where if it does go wrong and you're not prepared for it, like you could have, I, I have five XLR cables. I might not have five Limo cables. I might not have five mini XLR to full size XLRs, right? And if those go down and your audio's gone, well then you just have pretty images with no sound, right? And I think those are the two ones. It's like, A, can I rig it up in a variety of different ways? And B, does the audio workflow make sense to, it's there's less things that could screw up? Because if it can't happen, it will happen at some point. Gotcha. Mm. What about you, Jesse? I've got two. Um, one of them is a sync port, because um, I do a lot of high speed and we want to have the shortest clip possible. Mm. Um, and then also being able to do multi-passes, uh, just triggering that camera on and off um, with our robots and some other options. Um, so for anyone who doesn't know what he's talking about, so a sync port on his camera is just a, a way for him to trigger the camera's recording yep. remotely. So he doesn't want to have to like press the record button and start and stop it every single time because when they're doing stuff on the robot, those shots, especially if they're in super slow motion, they can get really long. You got a lot of dead space. So that's what that sync port is talking about. Exactly. Um, and then the other uh, functionality that I really like to have is uh, the Wi-Fi feature to be able to control the camera within my tablet or iPad. Um, uh, cause most of the time my camera is completely surrounded by, uh, lights and C stands and, or product. Um, it could be, have a probe lens on the end of it. You know, it just it depends. Like it's kind of hard to get to the camera sometimes. So, you know, changing, uh, something on the camera can be really difficult. So having that, fu that functionality is great. Yeah. That's really good. Mm -hmm. What about you, Marcus? Um, I have two, I have more, but my top two are, <laughs> Um, customizable buttons. I, mean, I want to be able to like change things on the fly and shooting a lot of run and gun dock. I want to be able to go from like, you know, 24 to, you know, slow motion um, with just, just like that. I don't have to, want, I don't want to have to go into the menu and select things because now I'm missing something um, in, uh, in the scene. And um, autofocus, I'm a doc shooter, like every yeah. now and then, especially mm -hmm. like a one man band sometimes. And I want the ability to chase my subject and keep them in, in, in uh, focus and, um, and not be so cinematic all the time. So yeah, the camera should be able to do both for me. Yeah, I think that's really good. I think I would say that my two probably are like, not necessarily what the camera can do for me but like these are problems that if the camera has i immediately have to write it off mm. and like the first one for me is overheating oh. because if a camera overheats like you're done yeah. you know what i mean like it's like the one thing like like to your point like yeah I, I rig out my cameras a lot in a lot of weird ways but like when the camera decides it's not going to work anymore because it's overheated and like i can't like i can't stick a fan in there i can't swap a battery no, like wait. there's not all you can do is sit and wait to me that's a an instant yeah. this camera is not going to work for my mm -hmm. workflow and then i think the second one kind of goes hand in hand but it's it is battery and it's a camera that has a really rough battery workflow i'm fine rigging up a v-mount battery and stuff but like if you give me a small camera like for example i, I hate to bash on them but i, I did it in like 15 videos, so I don't care anymore. The Blackmagic pocket cameras, because it's like, hey, our battery solution for you is this one. Stick it in your camera and use it, but it lasts 15, 15 20 minutes. minutes. <laughs> I'm like, that's not a solution. So you're yeah. you're forcing me to go find a, an external solution. Yep. Or even the Canon R5C is another example. That was a camera that I was really excited about. I loved it. Mm -hmm. But the battery solution was so bad from what they initially planned. Now, that said... I know some people are going to be like, well, when you buy red, you don't even get batteries. But for me, the solution is built into the camera, which is the V-mount batteries. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's like, okay, cool. I know what I'm getting into when I buy this system. Yeah. But for me, it's just those two things. Like if your camera's overheating or if the internal or the designed battery solution doesn't work, that's really, really rough because I need to be able to rig this camera down as small as I possibly can. Because yes, I understand you can always build it up. You can yep. always take an R5C or a Black Magic and throw V-mounts and all that stuff on it. But it's a small camera for a reason. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I need the battery life to work when it's at its smallest point. Yeah. So for me, those are my two. But what I do think is interesting here is that we all gave our points, but nobody's point actually had to do with image quality. 
Nobody I, said resolution. Yeah, I, I think yeah. I think the reason why is because image quality is so good now that it do, it's not the first thing on the list. And it like it, to the Black Magic point, I was like the I'm I'm doing this kind of challenge for myself where I'm like I'm gonna try to make the next three docs that I'm currently shooting work with the Black Magic, regardless. Like it, it's gonna be inconvenient. I'm just gonna have to roll the punches and, and find solutions for it. Mm -hmm. But one of those solutions was the battery life, right? Um, but and that would be something that would matter more to me about like the battery life. The image is great. Yeah. Right. But some of those workflow things in terms of like rigging it out and being able to be a little bit more malleable, you get a little bit frustrated sometimes. Yep. Right. Like right. I, rolling shutter. I don't even care. <laughs> like when I see it, I'm like, oh, it's there. But what drives me nuts is when I got to put the V mount battery in front and I'm like, the screen is so nice and high quality, but I'm just mucking it up because I'm putting this V mount battery in front of it. And I'm like, well, now the whole thing is kind of like it kind of feels a little bit denatured now you put yeah. this big nice screen and now i have to put this use thing in the front and then i don't i don't have like to get a, uh, a monitor of that quality i'm looking at a small hd that's going to cost me 1500 bucks mm -hmm. but almost about half as much as your camera at that point yeah. it yeah. literally right <laughs> and that's where um going through that sort of challenge like, you start to realize the image quality is like image and cameras great they're they're all really good down sampled 6k open gate all the other stuff it's really nice but it comes down to what is my use case and if my camera doesn't fit it that's going to impact me way more than this camera shoots 12k it that doesn't matter anymore and i don't and i don't think for a lot of and i think people try to justify the price of cameras by image quality and i don't necessarily think it's the right thing anymore yeah i think i agree yeah. with that i think i i mean my personal take as far as like cameras moving forward it, and this is why i think it's so hard when we get the question of like you know what's the best camera to buy is like image is kind of like a level playing field. It's like mm -hmm. almost like what's the best house to purchase? Like, well, they all have roofs. You know what I mean? Like yeah. image quality is like, yeah, the image quality is there, but you got to ask yourself. How are you going to use it? Exactly. And that becomes what you're willing to pay for or not pay for. Mm -hmm. And if something is worth it, because yeah. that's the thing I've been struggling with. Like I, you know, obviously I make camera reviews and stuff, but like, it's really hard to say like, is this camera worth the price or is this camera good or bad based off of the price? Yeah. Because a lot of the functionality that camera manufacturers are putting into their cameras now are very specific to the user. Yeah. And I might not need that thing. Like, yep. like for example, Kofi, you say like you don't really care about rolling shutter, right? Since shooting on the Komodo X, it's very hard for me to shoot video on something that doesn't have a global shutter now because my eye has gotten so trained to the look of global shutter that now I'm just like, I want everybody to put global shutter in all their cameras and we'll figure it out as we go. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, but that said, what is something that you guys are currently seeing, like as far as like a functionality thing that people are putting into their cameras now that have you the most excited? Like I know for Marcus, it may be some of the Sony AI autofocus stuff that's going on or whatever that might be. But what are some of the features that are maybe making their way into cameras that are going to help with functionality? Or what are some of the features you'd like to see yeah. camera manufacturers start adding in uh, that'll help? I've got one. Um, I know that a lot of these cameras are getting a lot more higher dynamic range. You know, sometimes they're like, oh, I'm 4K, you know, and your drone, you know, you point up the sky, it's completely blown out. You can't <laughs> see anything. Uh, but uh, now some of these cameras, the dynamic range, and I think that's what's coming, uh, helping push these images quality out better, right? To be able to walk into a room and oh, it's, it's capturing the darks and it's capturing the lights. Uh, so, and then on, you know, the new red, uh, that's that's out. They ha even have a little buffer inside of it. So like, even when you're filming, uh, you have a little extra on on either end yeah. to work with for that safetyness, the little safety yeah. net. Because maybe you're filming a wedding or a documentary, mm -hmm. and you know something's overexposed. You know, like having to change something on the fly could then mess everything up for you, and you miss the moment. So just stick with it and just keep capturing that moment because you have a little bit of give and take on either end. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think that's a big one. Yeah. How about you, Kofi? You got one? I, I think what I'm excited about is like the ecosystem building that everybody's doing and not just Sony, right? Like Sony, I think what ends up happening is when you buy into a Sony camera, I don't even know if you're buying image quality anymore. I think you're buying an ecosystem yeah. because you could move laterally with whatever you're doing, right? Everything has S-Log3 now. Everything has 10-bit. Everything is a full, like an email, not necessarily a full frame email, but it's all email. You can get the same lenses all across the board. And if you want to adapt it, you can adapt it kind of thing. Other companies I'm starting to find are catching on to that. And they're like, yeah, I shouldn't have a camera that feels like it's, it's on its own. And if I get like, say an R3, I can't get an R5C or a C70. Like they all can kind of play in the same ballpark. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the exciting thing for me because now companies are adopting the a kind of mentality where it's like, I don't care 
what camera you buy, but I just want you to get it from me. And then when you do want to do those upgrades, you're not thinking of, should I go to another system? It's more yeah. like, hey, you know what? I had an R8, I mm -hmm. think it's, I think the entry part is like, I had an R8. I'm thinking of maybe going with the R5 too, or whenever it comes out. And you can make that shift and it's the, the shift is just the camera body and it's not, I have to change all my whole life, right? Where I yeah. think buying cameras back before, um, you had, if you bought a new camera, you upgraded, even within the same brand, you had to change everything. Yeah. I, mm -hmm. I, I'm excited about there's that. There's some part. brands that are bad at that mm -hmm. still. Yeah, yeah. There's some there's, brands that are still working on it. And actually, somebody agreed with you, Kofi. Uh, they said that Kofi is right. The ecosystem is the biggest consideration uh, for the common person, which for me, I know like... I, so like a while ago, I know some people are going to hate this, whatever, but like, I, I love Nikons. Okay. I, I, I'm, I need to confess to you guys. I like to shoot on Nikon, <laughs> but <laughs> I support you. That's cool. Thank you. That's thank cool. you. These are, these are real friends. No. Um, but when I reviewed the Z9 at the time, I told them and like, cause Nikon obviously reached out, they sent us a camera and whatever to test out. And I was like, Hey, this is a great camera, but your ecosystem sucks. You know what I mean? Like, I was like, this is a really great camera, but no one's starting at a Z9. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and then they were like, Oh, okay. And then they came out with a Z8 and I was like, better. You know what I mean? And now we have the ZF and the ZFC. And so like, I believe that like, just like what you're saying, like you need to be able to like these camera manufacturers absolutely need to have like an ecosystem of cameras. Yeah, I will add one, you know, fantasy wish on top of this. And I just wish that these ecosystems played a little bit better cross brands. Yes. yes. And the reason I why I say that is that. like, I remember back in the day when, you know, I had Canon glass and I wanted to try Sony and there were adapters that would let the autofocus still work mm -hmm. or like Sigma made adapters where you could use the same lens across a Sony and a Canon because mm -hmm. it was the EF mount. Yeah. So it was a little bit easier to do that since we switched to these mirrorless, very thin flange distances. Like I found one adapter that will let you put Sony lenses on a Nikon body, mm -hmm. which is really, really nice. Like, cause the Nikon glass is still very big, like they're native glass. So the fact that I just unlocked all these new Sony lenses for my cameras. I love that fact, right? But I do wish that like <sighs> RF, like I know Canon's like shut uh, down the RF mount, which is geez. like, to me, very frustrating. But like, I liked back in the day when you had Tamron, you had Sigma, yeah. you had Canon, you had Sony, and they all kind of played together. I would love to see the ecosystems play a little bit closer together. That actually is a reason how I got back to Sony to begin with. So I had Sony cameras before, um, both broke down on the day of the lockdown. So I sent them back. Oh, like uh, COVID lockdown? Yeah, yeah, the day COVID lockdown, I had bro brought both my cameras to repair because the audio jack wasn't working. Um, and I picked the Pocket 4K and I'm like, I figured E-mount adapter, I'm going to get E-mount glass. I may as well get Canon camera. So I had the R5, uh, the R5 and the C70. And because of that not cross-pollination, um, I was actually, I think I was shooting some stuff for Mark Bone and Mike, and Mike Del Monte and I was helping them with like some operating stuff and they all had Sony. And I remember, and like, I, and I, they, they don't remember this and it probably wasn't a big deal, but I remember sending the footage back and I'm like, oh, is like the footage okay? Like I know I shot it on camera and I just got this message back of like, yeah, yeah, it looks good. And in my head, I'm like, oh, it's trash. I, got, I probably should switch because their workflow is all Sony stuff. Picked up the FX3, the FX6, like on the spot right on that day um, and that was because like, and, and my big thing was everybody around me like other people that own production companies and my other friends that were shooters as well if they needed somebody on set everybody was sony or red mm -hmm. and i was the one guy with a canon c70 where i'm like i can't even borrow stuff yeah, yeah. right so i'm like okay well i got to make that switch and literally that's what happened to get back into Sony really. Mm -hmm. Well, I hate that that happened to you cuz I don't <laughs> think that that should be everybody's story, you know? Yeah. No, like was... it, it's it definitely sucks when when that kind of stuff happens. But no, I definitely remember back in the day when, you know, you try to get a job and like this is like, you know, music videos specifically, they were like you shooting on a red. And I was like, I mean, I can. Like we can rent one. They're like, "Oh, you ain't got one. You ain't it." And I was just like, "Dude, that's not how it works." Like, do you got red money? Yeah, well, that was a whole different yeah, conversation. Yeah. But no, I think that to your point, like, you know, when it comes to having your different cameras and whatnot, I know that's really challenging. But like you guys, as far as like captive, y'all shoot on reds, cannons, like it 5Ds. 5D. Like it really just comes down to the job. <laughs> really right? just consider the job. You know, we do a lot of documenting and sometimes the job I, I just need to be able to put a 5D in a spot where it just needs to sit there for a couple of hours to capture a time lapse, you know, or we'll do C200 
um, where I'm just easy rig running around or <clears throat> we're doing the high end stuff where they're like, hey, we want to see the red, you know, bring out the big guns all the way to the phantom cameras where, uh, you know, owning one of those guys is, you know, like having a house, buying a house. It is buying a house. It is buying a house. <laughs> it is buying a house. So, um, well, at least here in Texas. <clears throat> yeah, in here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, changing the operating systems is, is, is crucial for our business because there's so many different types of jobs. Mm. I would love to ask Marcus at this point, you've been like, you've been kind of hearing all this about these different cameras. You haven't actually gotten a chance to test the reds yet, right? Well, I know you shot a little bit with mine, but when and a little bit with the Komodo and a little bit with the Komodo, that's, that's right. Yeah. So when you hear about all these different cameras in your flow, cause I know you're like you, I think a lot of people can really relate to like your journey. Cause you're, you're, you're much smaller of a team when it comes to like you getting hired out to do individual jobs, just as a shooter, unlike with Kofi's situation, how have you been able to like talk through people? Cause I would imagine if you want to shoot something on Fuji, that's probably the camera you're going to get the most pushback on. Cause if someone does ask you, Oh, what are you shooting on? If you say any Canon camera or any Sony camera, I feel like most people are going to kind of be like, Oh, okay. But like with Fuji, how have you been able to talk through it? Cause I know you told me this before, yeah. but like when you, when a client calls you or someone hires you to shoot and they're like, Oh, what camera do you have? And you say, Oh, I'm going to shoot it on Fuji. When they give you that little bit of pushback, how have you been able to overcome that? Yeah, so it's so weird because I've been hired by multiple different production companies and only one asked me the question. And I believe it's because they saw my work first and I sent them a reel and most of those images were shot on Fuji and they just said, I want that. <laughs> you know, it was like this, whatever you did or whatever you shot it with, I just want that. And most of them are just asking for it to be in log. Now I do have a Sony client and we have to actually rent out Sony cameras, but because I've used them and I have experience with them, it's never a problem. We just budget it out and, and then and I get the camera. So I, don't, I haven't gotten any pushback on Fujifilm at all yet. Yeah. No. I think what's interesting though, was that you say that, you know, you show them your work. And I think that is the one thing that I feel like if you're a creator and you're getting into these like gear questions, mm -hmm. especially with like clients and stuff, or even if somebody's like questioning your, you know, oh, would you shoot that on? Or oh, how did you pull that off? I think if your work is good enough, it should speak for itself. And if you're a little worried about the camera that you have, like let your work be what speaks for you and speaks beyond the camera. Because I'll tell you, like you might think that if you buy a red that the questions stop, <laughs> it don't stop. Like, in fact, there's actually like, I feel like there's like, it's almost like a, a hill. Yeah. Like when you start getting to the red side, like you're like, oh, like people won't, people won't care once I shoot on red. It actually starts going downhill at that point because now when they see it shot on red, they are way more picky. Everything gets way more criticized and it's like, oh, but you didn't like that perfectly or, oh, you didn't do this or, oh, you didn't do that. And so I would strongly recommend you as somebody who literally started on a T2i has gone all the way to shooting on the highest end red cameras, but I honestly find myself really enjoying cameras that are more so in the middle. And even from red, like I have a Raptor, but my favorite camera is the Komodo X. Mm -hmm. Like it's not even their biggest red camera. Mm -hmm. Like the truth is, is that whole chasing gear thing doesn't really land you anywhere that's going to be sufficient. But if you do have work, I think that one, you'll be more proud of what you make with what you have. Mm -hmm. And then when your work really stands out for itself, like it won't matter what you're shooting on. Yeah. Because I've never, I've never cared what Kofi's stuff was on. Like Justin, like nine times out of 10, we're only asking like, okay, what's the frame rate? Yeah. Like that's all we care about. Like, I don't even care what the camera is. Like what's the yep. frame rate going to look like? And then the same with Marcus, like when we shoot together, it's just like, what, what are you bringing? That's it. Only because I want to make sure I have the right memory cards to give you. That's, That's literally the only thing <laughs> yes, I care yeah. about. Or if I have some lenses I could throw your way yep. to help with the yep. project. But other than that, I could absolutely care less. And I think that's how it is. Like once you start doing this at a professional level. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I think specific, and I, this is, again, this might be specific to myself. I think I like testing and tinkering with things to find out. Cause like say a new camera comes out and I'm like, I like, and this might be for, I don't know if you guys feel this, where you're already kind of honed into your own shooting style where the tool doesn't matter so much so you want to try everything to see if your style works in that tool if that makes any sense yeah mm -hmm. it's like imagine you if you owned a sneaker shop right and you play basketball mm -hmm. and you're like i'm already comfortable with my game already 
let me try a different pair of shoes. And like, it just, just out of curiosity. And yeah. I think with YouTube inside of things, like I, I mean, you both have the pleasure of being able to get the ability to do that where I'm like, you know what, let me, let me try shooting this next project on a, on a Nikon just because I already know just my own stuff, but I just want to know yeah. what happens. Right. Right. And you get that, you get that kind of, and I, and I think what's hard about that is that a lot of people don't understand that experience because it's a 0.5% of people experience mm -hmm. where someone's going to say like, Hey, Brandon, I'll push back though. I feel like. I feel like you can get that experience. Mm. I think you just have to overcome the fear of renting because I feel True. like, and this is, uh, this may be a hot take. So bear with me, but I feel like way too many filmmakers, videographers, content creators buy a camera because a YouTuber told them to buy it. I know I'm guilty because I'm one of those YouTubers <laughs> without fully testing the range of cameras that are actually out there mm -hmm. because they're afraid to rent something and not know how to use it. Yeah. And I think like that can really hurt you in the long run <clears throat> because everybody, like you said, all those Sony shooters and you were shooting with Mark Bone and all them and you were like, oh, I guess I need to shoot Sony because they're all shooting Sony. So I'm going to go that route. And like through that, like no hard, no, you probably had no problems with the Sonys that you went with, but you never really experienced the Fuji. You never really experienced mm -hmm. the Nikon. So who knows? You might have found the F for fun in <laughs> Fuji, Fuji. <laughs> and but you never allowed yourself to go down that rabbit hole. And I'm I'm saying that as somebody who is guilty of the same. Yeah. Like I chased Red for so long because you know my favorite directors shot their best movies on Reds, and I was mm. like, I gotta go that way. I gotta go that way to a point to where like I completely shunned Nikon to the side and was like. That's not for real filmmakers mm -hmm. until I finally got the opportunity to try it for myself and was like, oh, dang, this actually yeah. is a pretty good camera. I think the only caveat for that is that I think where people have access to rental shops for the things that they want to mm -hmm. try is scarce. That is true. Right. So like if like, for example, when I when I when that decision was made, that was 2020. The Fuji X uh, H2S didn't even exist. Mm -hmm. Like Fuji video focused cameras didn't even exist at the time. Nikon video focus cameras didn't exist at the time, mm -hmm. right? You had like, the, literally it was, you got a C70, a Pocket 6K Pro, an FX6, an FX3, or the original Red Komodo. It's funny, we've come a long way yeah. since yeah. 2020. It's like, like, when you think, think about, about how many yeah. cameras, like how yeah. good cameras have gotten yeah. just in the last four how years. How many cameras have come how out many, since that time, many right? Cameras are, Isn't um, that wild? And yeah. I think that might be also a thing as well. I think what ends up happening is that when you live, in, like if you live in a major city, you can you can go to the rental shop and pick something up. Yeah. Right. But if I'm in like even if you're in Ontario, if you're somewhere that's not in the GTA, good luck. Right. Mm -hmm. There might be one camera of that type that you got to go and drive from wherever you are out east all the way down to the city to borrow for a day. And if I, like that's the kind of hassle yeah. kind of thing you like when, when, when we're in our space. And I guess that's kind of the, the, the difference, too. Right. When you get somebody that's starting out it's kind of hard for them to understand how the rental process works. Yeah. For us, it's easy because we know where to find those things. We know where our proximity is. Yeah. But then if I'm somebody who doesn't know if I want to get an FX3 or maybe I want to get uh, a Canon R5C. Mm -hmm. you got to rely the, on the YouTuber. Yeah. And you have to, right? And I, you know what, too? And, and the thing is, I think the way that some people watch YouTube is kind of like that end-all, be-all, right? Like, mm -hmm. In my head, and like, and this is my own fantasized world, is that when you watch, if I watch a Brandon, like a, one of Brandon's reviews, I just watch this topical information in the event that I that I want to that I come in, in contact with that camera, mm -hmm. not necessarily as I want you to tell me what to buy. I just want to. I I heard this thing came out. I trust your opinion. I just want to hear what it is, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? And I want to hear as many people that I trust until I make a decision. And I think that's kind of where, and I guess it's a little bit more frequent when some people do just hear the one review and they say, yep, I'll buy that thing because a person I like bought it. And I'm like, I don't know if that's exactly the way you should watch and consume YouTube content like that. And I, and I never have, like usually when like I am interested in a camera, I'll watch at least 10 different people have an opinion before I'm like, okay, maybe I'll pull the trigger. And I also ask people that have nothing to do with cameras. Well, Justin, you're not a YouTuber. I'm not a YouTuber. So I'd love to hear your perspective yeah. on this. You know, I was thinking, uh, like, you know, a lot of people don't have the money to just go spend $200, $300 on renting a camera when they're like, I could use that money towards 
buying the camera that I actually want. Um, and they're like, well, I don't like this camera and I got to spend another $300 on this person or this rental. Um, I think one of the best things is try to get yourself into the community. Uh, talk to your friends like, bro, you and I have, uh, lent each other so much pieces of equipment. Uh, I didn't even have to buy it. You know, I just, a homie, homie trade, uh, for, Hey, you need this piece. I need that piece. I think that's a really great way to get your hands on some equipment. Um, and then, you know, I think, uh, for me, what I've done is I commit. I have committed to the C70, the C200, the, the Komodo, and the Gemini, uh, and I use that camera to the best of my ability until I knew I was ready to upgrade. So, like, buy within your means now, and then you know you, you'll be able to maximize that camera, and then when your brain gets to the point where you're ready to level up, hit that next tick, then you've probably already saved a little bit of money, and you're already ready to go and do that next, that next purchase. And then for me, also just owning that camera. Like I need to go test um, this shot. Now I gotta go rent it, you know, the mm -hmm. camera or ask my buddy. Having that Ronin 2 with the red Gemini and the suction mounts and be able to like, I'm gonna go test the shot today. We're gonna, we're gonna drive s some cars. Like I wouldn't be able to practice those things if I didn't own it, but I, you have to invest in yourself. Yeah. But you can't get those pieces until you start with a smaller piece and then evolve into the next biggest piece. Guys, thank you so much for hopping on the show with me. Absolutely. Before we bounce out of here, we'll kind of go counterclockwise. Let the people know where they can find you and like where they can find you on social. What's your social handles? What's all that stuff? Start with you, Marcus. Okay, mostly I am on Instagram at Marcus R Films. Um, I post a lot of stories, pretty cool content, and I am revising, reviving, reviving my YouTube channel, which is still Marcus R Films. Or Marcus R. Robinson, something like that. So, so you don't know what your YouTube is. Great. Yeah. All right, go ahead. Moving on, Justin. <laughs> What's going on, everybody? I'm uh, Justin Bowers 360 on all channels: uh, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, um, and you can also find us on Captive Studios, Captive Creative. Uh, Captive doesn't have an E at the end of it. Uh, give us a follow. Yes. See, that was easy. You see, just one handle just everywhere. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. How about you, Kofi? Uh, you guys can find me in there. My name's Kofi Aboa. Uh, that's my YouTube name. I am Kofi Aboa is also my Instagram. Easy way to find me. I post a almost unreasonable amount of YouTube videos. So that is true. you'll see me on the home feed at some point. Yeah. That is very true. He he has the craziest cadence and I, I have a team and I still can't keep up. So mm. yeah, keep crushing it. Thank, uh, you, thank you guys so much for watching this. Check in. Be sure to hit the like button on your way out so that way the algorithm knows that we have a good time here. Obviously, we don't do this video. We don't do the live stream for the algorithm. We do it for you guys and that's why we try to make it as engaging and as much fun as we possibly can. But of course, as always, I hope you guys enjoy your weekend. Go out and shoot something dope. Have a great time. And we'll catch you guys next week. Same time, 11 o'clock Central Standard Time. See you guys there. Peace. Make the money rain.